So welcome everybody from uh, me as well. Um, I'm going to be giving an introduction to gene lists. Uh, one of the things that we find every year is that some people know um, already how to use some of the some of the basic tools. They know they already have gene lists that they work with, and some people have never really worked with g large gene lists. So this um, intro um, might be familiar to some, but we need to have it here to kind of get everyone on the same page with some of the basics. Um, and um, there will be something that you'll likely learn even if you're an expert in, in gene lists. So I'm going to talk about um, just you know the idea of gene lists, what what they what they represent, and then talking talk about um, places to go get information about gene lists and how to deal with with identifiers. This is probably one of the things that almost everybody ha uh, is a headache for almost everybody. Is sort of if you're mixing gene if you're getting gene lists from other people or you're mixing gene lists from from different sources, um, how to connect them together. So the basic idea is, um, yeah, which, which most of you are, uh, I guess, most biologists are facing these days, is I have some screen or gene expression experiment or chip, chip uh, experiment, and I have hundreds or thousands of hits. Um, now what? So what do I do with all these gene lists? Um, and um, basically what we're going to, the, the sort of main question that we want to ask is, tell me what's interesting about these genes. Um, and one of the uh, sort of this is what we're focusing most of the, the um, lecture on. So you can get your, your gene lists, say from gene expression experiment. You might get a, a, a list of, of genes ranked by full change, comparing your um, cell, cell line state of interest to a control. Um, or you might have a lot of different gene expression experiments and you cluster them. And um, that cluster represents a set of genes, might be, have 100 genes in it, and you want to summarize that cluster, find out what that cluster means. Um, and uh, the way we're, we're doing this is by combining um, this gene list with information, prior information we know about how the cell works um, or about physiology, uh, depending on the, on the system that you're looking with. And there's a huge amount of information that we know from databases. And this, um, there's a number of different types of ways of doing this analysis to um, try and figure out what about, what, uh, about biological processes you know, this, this experiment is telling me about. Um, and um, see, I think I'll just switch to. Oops. There's another slide I wanted to use here. Okay, um, it's not working. So um, basically, uh, we 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 developed a kind of overview workflow um, that will also modify during the course. And the um, uh, the workflow will kind of summarize the different different areas of the course and the tools that we're using. Um, but basically, as I mentioned, uh, gene lists come from all different types of places, and that means that they mean different things. So um, you can have molecular profiling, um, micro, uh, transcript or proteomics data. Um, you can uh, just identify a set of genes. Some of these technologies just identify genes, and so they, they're not associated with any kind of additional numbers. Um, you just get a, a flat gene list. And sometimes you get some quantification, some additional number, which allows you to, um, it's basically gene list plus values, and allows you to rank um, or cluster the, the, the information. Um, we're not actually going to go over how to do that in this course. So we expect that this course starts with the gene list, not um, uh, you, you have to know how to do the ranking or clustering yourself before. And it's fairly important to actually do that well so that you get a good gene list um, to input into the, the next tools. Protein-protein um, interaction or CHIP, transcription factor binding sites, somebody mentioned that earlier, um, also generate lists of genes. Um, genetic screens is another common um, thing that we, uh, that we see. People are doing an RNAi screen, for instance, with a, a phenotype that's output. And um, you get a list of genes that that affect are affected by uh, that um, affected by RNAi when looking at that phenotype, and then clinical more um, clinical genomics type of uh, um, applications, um, next generation sequencing of tumor uh, of tumors, generating a huge amount of mutations which can be mapped to genes, or if you're doing an association study. Um, looking at a specific disease and you have a, a, lo a lot of mutations, m markers like SNPs or copy number variants that are associated with the, with the disease, um, converting those to gene lists as well, um, and then trying to understand what that's telling you, what, what biological processes, for instance, are involved in the, in the disease is, is interesting. So, um, so I mentioned, so most of these, uh, 
you know, so a, a gene list can mean different things. Most of the experimental methods that we, um, I mentioned before, usually have something to do with uh, understanding more about protein complexes, pathways, physical interactions. Um, you might have a screen that just uh, tries to find genes that have similar function, like find me all the protein, you, you get a screen that finds all protein kinases, which is not really related to one biological process, it's just a, a particular type of molecular function. Um, or it might be related to location in the cell or tissue. Um, just give me everything in the nucleolus. Uh, you could use mass spectrometry to do that. And then um, also, um, it might also be chromosomal location. So there might be linkage groups in, in your association study and you, you have a whole bunch of genes that are uh, on a, a, a section of a chromosome uh, that are associated with your disease, that, that locus in your chromosome is associated with the disease, and you want to find out which, what's the causal, what's, what's the causal gene, or what's most likely um, interesting in the, in the disease. So, um, so because gene lists mean different things, you have to know what you want to accomplish with your list, and hopefully that's part of the experimental design. Um, but basically, um, as I mentioned, one, one of the things that you can do is you could just summarize all the biological processes that, uh, or other aspects of gene function that, are, that, 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 that gene is telling you about. And that is um, mostly hypothesis generating. So um, you know, if, you if you're doing a screen and you, you have no idea what to expect, that's usually a very useful place to start. So the screen says, OK, this, um, all, all of these genes that are coming out of the screen are related to the cell cycle. So the cell cycle must be important in this, in this phenotype. Um, and then you can, you can test that. Um, uh, if you, uh, people are also very interested in finding a controller for a specific process, um, and usually this uh, is, um, it could be any kind of molecule, it could be a controller in the cell, um, but um, usually we don't have a lot of information about protein or small molecule controllers unless you're, you're adding those things in your experiment. For instance, you're, you're uh, adding a small molecule or growth factor and you're seeing the result. Um, but we do have a lot of information about transcription factors and microRNAs from um, gene expression experiments, and um, sometimes those can be those can be um, you can if you have information about a lot of those you can find a controller. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and uh, finding uh, another question that people are interested in is if you know something about a pathway um, and you, you're very interested in that pathway and finding new members of that pathway or new members of that complex. Um, you know, I have a set of genes and I want to get new information. I, I want to find similar genes that, um, that I could uh, test as a new member of that pathway. Um, and uh, that's sort of related to this sort of discovering new gene function. Um, um, it might not just be a single gene, it might be the function of the set of genes that you have in your list. Uh, and then I, I mentioned um, correlating a disease with a, a phenotype. I mentioned the Canada gene prioritization. This is another really interesting uh, area that people are really interested in. Often, from when you have association studies uh, in human genetics, you, you can get a list of genes. You don't know which one um, is really underlying the, the effect, and you might be interested in finding the causal gene. Uh, maybe it's not one gene. Maybe it's lots of genes, but um, trying to link um, look, at, look at the function of genes and relate it to the function of other genes that are associated with that disease might help you better understand um, which of a set of genes is most likely to be fu more functionally similar to, the, to what you expect. Um, and, and also performing differential analysis. So uh, what's different between samples? If I have um, tum uh, tumor and tissue around the tumor, um, you know, what's specific to the tumor or different stages of tumor, or if you have time points, uh, in your experiment, you have 12 hours, 24 hours, etc. What is changing over that over the over time? Um, and um, uh, being able to compare all of the results of your gene function and pathway, or your pathway analysis, for instance, across time points, will tell you you know something maybe about the dynamics. It doesn't have to be time points; it could just be different different stages of a of an experiment or different different ex um, um, different uh, um, cell lines or, or something like that. So um, um, this is actually a good place for me to try and find this, this workflow thing. There it is. Um, so we're, we're, we put together sort of, um, we're, we're going to be updating this slide um, over the course of the workshop but, um, uh, and, and adding sort of the tools that we, that we go over for each section. But basically, this is sort of the, the general workflow of the course that we'll refer back to uh, in different people's, uh, different instructors' uh, lectures. So we start with some gene list. Um, here we have a set of human genes as an example. 
Um, the first thing that we'll be talking about is annotation, so getting more information about these gene lists in an automated way, not just um, looking it up in individually. Um, we'll also be talking about um, something called gene set enrichment, which is um, trying to find out if there's something surprising in these gene sets. Like, as I mentioned, it might, you might get a, a whole bunch of genes, and uh, there's, they're, they're significantly enriched in cell cycle genes. Um, uh, another thing is pathway or network analysis, where you consider connections among the genes, and there, there might be different types of connections. The, the genes might encode proteins that interact, or they might be part of the same pathway, in which case you have a process diagram that, um, or a process, you have some understanding about the process, like A phosphorylates B and B phosphorylates C, etc. Um, and then sort of seeing where your genes fit in, in that process, and that helps you um, kind of connect your gene list to biological pathways that you might be familiar with, a map of the cell that you might be familiar with if you studied a lot of cell biology, um, that, that sort of um, your understanding of the cell. So that's, that helps connect your, I mean, all of these things, I guess, when we're dealing with processes are helping you connect um, your gene list to sort of your idea of how, your model of how things are working. But network analysis and pathway analysis are usually focused on biological processes. And then um, gene function prediction, which is I have a list of genes Tell me more about this. Uh, tell me, tell me more genes that are that might that should be on this list. Like, if I have um, some members of a complex, give me more members of that complex. So predict new members of the complex that you can then then go and test. So, um, but first, uh, so we're going to go over all of those fun things. But first, we just wanted to go over some of the basics. Um, and uh, two major areas are. Um, of basic information is attributes and gene identifiers and mapping. So I'm just going to go over attributes in the beginning. Um, so um, there's a, a huge amount of information available about genes in databases. And um, uh, ideally, um, and, and, and it's, it's useful to know sort of how to get quick access to all of that information. So um, all the information you expect uh, a, a, um, a huge amount of functional information, functional annotation information. If you have a gene, you might already know the biological process, the molecular function, it's a kinase or the location, you know where it is in the genome. Um, you might know, it, there, there might be an, an existing association of this gene with a disease if it's, if it's human. Um, there might be a, a, a lot of information about um, uh, the, the gene structure, the gene model, where the introns and exons are, if there's splice variants. Um, if there's known transcription factor binding sites upstream of the gene, uh, if there's known, known variation, um, and, uh, and also protein properties, protein domains, sec uh, secondary and tertiary structure, the 3D structure of the, pro of, the, of the protein might be known. It might be known that the gene is phosphorylated, so post-translation modification, um, and you also might know how the gene interacts with, with other genes. So um, there's a, this is a really huge amount of information, and actually it's fairly challenging to kind of collect all of this data for, for a set of genes. So um, we're going to uh, talk, I'm going to talk initially about gene function annotation, um, explaining gene ontology, and then I'll talk about um, a, meth, uh, a, a place where we like um, to go get a lot of th this type of information uh, that's sort of present in a convenient way, or available conveniently. So how many people have already, already know about the gene ontology or use it? Okay. How many people really know about the gene ontology, like ex our experts in gene ontology? So about a third of the class already knows about the gene ontology, so that's, that's good. Um, okay, so um, the gene ontology is a system for, um, that's, that's very widespread. It's, very, uh, it's used uh, quite a lot to define gene function. To, um, and basically, it's a set of uh, biological phrases or terms which people have agreed upon to apply to genes. So there might be a, a name, a, a term called protein kinase, another term called apoptosis, um, or a term plasma membrane, or something like that. Um, the, there's there's thousands of these terms, um, and they're they're sort of these agreed upon terms that uh, they're sort of standardized. Uh, gene ontology is also a dictionary because almost all the terms have a definition, so you can actually look up if you don't know what um, a um, certain type a cilia is or something, you can look it up the, de the definition. Um, and 
Um, it's also an, an ontology. So the, this word ontology just means a formal system for describing knowledge. Just somebody has thought about how to organize and structure information um, formally, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that, that means. So, um, so the ontology aspect is um, uh, the, is uh, basically the, the terms are related with, um, within a, a hierarchy. Um, so you have uh, relationships between terms. You don't just have a flat list of terms. Um, this is sort of part of the ontology idea. Uh, so, um, and, and this, this hierarchy defines gene function at multiple levels of detail. Um, so for instance, you have at the top the gene ontology, and then you have, there's, there's a biological process um, and physiological process, and you get more specific all the way down to uh, tissue homeostasis, immune cell homeostasis, um, B cell um, homeostasis and then B cell apopto apoptosis. So, uh, when in this hierarchy, the the um, things at the top are more general, things at the bottom are more specific, and there's relationships between these terms. So, in this case, red here is um, uh, there's two types of relationships mostly. Uh, is and part of, and I can't remember what red is. I guess it's um, it is a part of. Um, and black is ISA. So um, B cell apoptosis is a type of apoptosis, which is a um, type of programmed cell death. Uh, and um, if you look at this, this uh, hierarchy for different terms of, of interest, um, you can get an idea of how the terms are related. Um, most of the part of relationships are in the cell component, so you'd have something like nucleolus as part of the nucleus. Um, terms can have more than one parent, and um, like B cell apoptosis has two types of Two, two parents. Um, it's a type of apoptosis, and it's also a type of. It's part of B cell homeostasis. That's important to understand. Um, here's the sort of more detailed example with um, a simple, simple, um, another simple example. Um, one thing that's that's important is that gene ontology is in general species independent. So um, some lower, some some more specific terms are are specific to uh, a group. Um, like chloroplast is specific to plants, um, but higher level terms are generally general for, for any, any organism. So in general, this can be used for any organism, and that's the goal of the gene ontology. Um, so I mentioned um, different, different types of gene function. Go covers three. They sort of divided gene function into three different uh, types. Cell component, where, where things appear in the cell. Um, molecular function, what the, the enzymatic function is, uh, for instance, um, protein kinase or glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. Um, usually these, these, pro these terms have something activity afterwards, so the protein has isomerase activity, uh, or the gene has the, encodes a protein with isomerase activity. And then biological process, this is more sort of related to pathways, although the pathways can be very general. Um, so Go terms are, um, the terms themselves are, are added by a, a group of editors at the European Bioinformatics Institute in Hingston, uh, near Cambridge, in the UK, and also from database groups that are uh, working with individual organisms, like the, the yeast genome database or the mouse genome database, are adding, adding Go terms that are important for their uh, communities. Um, you can also request a term to be added. Anybody can do this. Um, also, experts help with sort of major areas of redevelopment in, in gene ontology. So, gene ontology is actually being edited all the time. Um, there's new terms added every week, and um, and people from all over the world are actually actually organizing this. So, just as of this morning, I, I checked, there was um, uh, over 32,000 terms, almost all of them with definitions. Um, the, the majority are, in, are different types of biological processes. Um, there, but there's also almost 3,000 cell components defined and almost 10,000 types of molecular function. So the second part of gene ontology, first part of gene ontology is these terms, this dictionary of terms and their relationships. Um, that's the real gene ontology. The second part of gene ontology that really makes it useful for us is annotations. Basically, this is taking a term from the dictionary and linking it to a gene. And um, that's a separate group of people, a separate process that does that. Um, and in general, these things are known as gene associations or go annotations. Um, you can have multiple annotations per gene. So a given, a given gene might be a protein kinase involved in the cell cycle, present in the, um, in the nucleus. Um, and um, 
most of the gene ontology annotations are, are um, well, a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different types of gene ontology annotations that are reviewed manually, but there's also uh, a section that is created automatically, and I'll go over more of that in, in detail. Um, so um, uh, this is this is fairly a fairly important point when you're working with gene ontology. Um, uh, what usually the type of annotation that people want is the sort of high quality annotation that people that some scientist has verified is is correct um, and uh, it's curated by by trained scientists it's usually higher quality um, but unfortunately there's there's reduced coverage your gene might not have being curated by by a scientist um, so there's a smaller number of of, uh, of type of information about this because it's time consuming to, to create all this information um, so there's a second gener a second level that um, of uh, quality that is um, reviewed computational analysis this is something where a computer program has tried to predict something about the gene function, but then somebody has checked that it's reasonable. Um, and then there's pure electronic annotation, which is uh, annotation derived without any kind of human oversight at all. And um, this uh, accuracy varies. Some of these computational predictions are actually really good, um, but in general it's considered low, lower quality than, than the manual um, type of, of annotation. Um, and uh, just an example of a type of computational annotation that's really good, um, there's, a, there's a couple of examples. So co computer programs are very good at predicting trans, uh, certain types of features on proteins, like transmembrane domains are very well predicted. Signal sequences, like um, or nu you know, nuclear export sequences, nuclear import sequences, those are very well predicted because they're very clear motifs for, that you can find in a protein. And also protein domains, like protein kinase, might be recognized because it's similar to other protein kinases. And so often things like um, transmembrane domains, you'll see an annotation associated with that called membrane. That might be more trustworthy because the computer programs behind that are well known to be very high quality. Um, but other things where it's just, uh, um, hold on, I'll come to you in a sec. Um, other, other types of uh, information where it's just purely um, enzymatic activity by sequence similarity um, uh, for any, any given enzyme activity might be, might be um, um, especially if there's a bunch of enzyme, enzyme activities that are um, uh, in related um, sequences, sequences that are very similar to each other, but the enzyme activity is different, that will, you know, computer programs do a terrible job of predicting that. So um, it's just really important to be aware of the annotation origin, and I'll tell you how to do that in a sec. Question? Um, they are reviewing papers, um, and um, it depends on the, the source of the annotation. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the annotation sources in a sec. So um, the um, so so for some for some organisms it might be better than others. So I'll talk I'll talk about that. So there's um, each time that somebody uh, one of these these curators or annotators or automated systems assign a term from the gene ontology to a gene they add some more information about that. It's not just, the, it's not just A and B connect. It's, it's, um, they, they assign an evidence code, which is their, their evidence for actually assigning that term to the gene. And there's lots of different evidence codes. This is in your book for, for your, your information. All of these evidence codes in red are manually um, reviewed, uh, and these, this evidence code in blue inferred from electronic annotation is the, is the part that's not manually reviewed at all. So you can see that there's ex types of experiment, ex uh, evidence codes from experiments, so inferred from experiment. Um, there's computational analysis evidence code, um, like what I mentioned, reviewed computational analysis or um, inferred from uh, sequence alignment or sequence orthology. Um, and uh, there's, this is what you were asking about. There's a, a set of evidence codes that's probably the highest quality, which is some author statement in a paper, either um, traceable or, or non-traceable. And then this is where the curators are, are kind of um, creating, kind of a, synthesizing the literature and adding their own, in, their own knowledge. Um, you have a code called inferred by curator. Um, they could also say there's no biological data available because they, they did a full literature search and they couldn't find anything. Um, so. Um, these codes are associated with, the, with um, gene ontology annotations, and um, this no biological data available might not be very useful for you. Um, also, typically, a lot of times people are, are removing this type, of, this uh, inferred from electronic annotation before they, um, they do analyses, or at least for first-pass analysis. 
Um, as I mentioned, the difference between these reviewed ones and the, the non-reviewed ones is coverage. So um, the, these reviewed ones only cover so many genes, and you might have a number of genes that only have electronic annotation. And so if you have a set of genes that has very low coverage um, and there's only electronic annotation, you might be forced to try and use that, although you should understand that where it's coming from and so that you can, you can uh, decide for yourself if, if the results that you get from your analysis are valid. So, um, so all major eukaryotic model organism species and are, are covered by, by, genome, by um, um, gene ontology annotations. Um, the Uniprot database, which is a big protein database uh, based uh, mostly in, in Europe, um, has a gene ontology annotation group that is responsible for human annotations, um, but mostly most um, model organism databases will also have um, uh, their own gene ontology annotation groups that are basically just focused on updating these annotations. A number of bacterial parasite species um, uh, are available as well. Some of these are more automated. Uh, and, and there's always new species annotations in development. If you're working with a, a genome that is fairly well established, usually you can, go down to, you can go to the gene ontology website and just download the gene ontology annotations and they'll be available in every software package that you're using, the ones that we'll be talking about today. If you're working on a new genome, you just sequence a new genome, there might, there, there's not going to be any, any gene ontology annotations available. However, there's probably a lot of tools um, that are part of the Genome Sequencing Center's pipeline for when they assemble um, the, the genome and then find the genes, um, they probably have a, an extra step of that pipeline that um, annotates um, gene ontology terms by orthology to other to close species. And that's an automated process. So those, those types of things will be only inferred from electronic annotation, but at least you get some gene ontology terms for, for that new species. So there's um, the other the other interesting thing is there's vari variable coverage. The slide is a little bit out of date. I just took it from this this paper from 2005. I haven't seen an update um, yet, but um, but the, the the message still stands that depending on the species that you're looking at, gene ontology annotations can be really good, really good coverage, and maybe not so good. So um, one of the best is yeast, uh, budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The yeast genome database had a very large project to make sure that every single gene in yeast was looked at and by, by someone at least once, and um, even if they verified that there was no data available. Um, but you can see that there's actually, um, um, so this is, this is the, the, the light gray is electronic annotations and the, the dark gray is non-electronic annotations. So yeast is 100% covered by non-electronic uh, uh, annotations, those are the human reviewed ones. Um, and these guys, um, there's a sort of number of model organisms starred here with a red star. So you can see the difference. Some of them only in 2005, like, like mouse, only had 50% coverage. It's much higher now. Um, and you know, some of them have 100% coverage. So um, sometimes we've, we've worked with, for instance, C. elegans or, or fruit fly. And the coverage, the gene ontology annotations um, for, for fruit fly haven't been as good as, some, as when we're working yeast. But they're improving all the time. Um, so there's, a, there's uh, just to further answer your question, um, there's a number of different contributing databases to the annotations. And in fact, anybody can make annotations available. If you, if you have um, a way of predicting gene function, you can make available annotations and you can advertise them. Um, if, if they're um, official, like, like from these, um, these various databases, then, you can, um, then they would be available on the Gene Ontology website. So you might, you might actually be able to get gene ontology annotations from a place other than the gene ontology website. Um, so one of the problems with gene ontology that you'll probably face when you work with this information is that there are sometimes too many terms. So I mentioned there's 32,000 terms. Um, and if you want to just make a simple pie chart, I have 100 genes and I want to just summarize the function in a pie chart, like, you know, tell me how many things are in the nucleus. Um, it might be difficult because... Um, there's not just a term called nucleus, there's a term called nucleus, and every t different part of the nucleus, um, chromatin, nucleolus, and there's, there's, there might be hundreds of terms related to the nucleus. So, um, so that, that, that might be really nice to, to look at if you're looking at individual genes, but if you're summarizing them like this, then it, you'd get 1,000 or 100 little pie slices, which is not useful. So um, there's a type of, uh, there's an there's a additional set of ontologies called um, GoSlim, 
um, which is an officially reduced set of Go terms that sometimes is, is nice for a high-level view. So the, they've traded off number of terms for the speci uh, for the spe in terms of uh, speci specificity of those terms. So you won't get very detailed terms. Um, you'll just get more general ones, but um, the, and but there'll be fewer of them, so they're easier to work with. So there's there's a specific there's a generic Go Slim that's useful for every you basically eukaryotic or non eukaryotic cell, um, and then there's a plant and yeast version, and there might be other other versions, other specific versions. Um, so um, The other thing that's useful to say here is that um, when you're doing these kinds of summaries, you often realize quickly that a given that it's that's difficult to work with genes that have multiple annotations. So if a gene is known to be involved in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, maybe it's shuttling back and forth, then um, you know which pie slice does it go to? Um, is it you know you'll you'll have to basically decide whether you want to have it as one of them because you're interested in only the nuclear part of its function or you'll decide that it has to be part of both pie slices and so that the numbers get updated. So that's something that you have to think about. Um, often um, in genomic studies that I've been a part of, um, if people are really interested in getting a very detailed view of um, a very um, sort of study specific summary like high level summary like this, they'll actually go through the list and choose the the, the individual terms that they're most interested in. So if they're only interested in the cell cycle, maybe they'd be interested in more nuclear-based um, um, related functions rather than some other unrelated function. Um, but that really requires manual curation. And um, if you're, but if you're making a paper of a figure for nature or science or something or cell, that might be worth doing that. Um, and in general, actually, a lot of tools. Um, on the visualization side, don't do a great job of visualizing multiple different functions because if a gene has 20 different functions, it's actually hard to visualize that in a pie chart or something like that. We can we can talk about that later. Um, okay, so uh, there's a number of different tools that are available. You can go to geneontology.org slash go tools um, if you're interested, but we will be introducing specific ones and talking about specific ones here. So uh, a good place to get information about gene ontology is uh, QuickGo. So if you type in QuickGo into Google or type in this, this uh, URL, then you can um, search for a Go term um, or search for a protein or compare Go terms. Um, and that uh, chart that I showed you in one of the previous slides is accessible from this, from this uh, page as well. So you can sort of navigate through this, this uh, hierarchy of gene ontology information. You can see statistics about the Go term. And if you're just looking to get familiar with gene ontology, this is a good place to browse around, um, just to get an idea of the types of information and, and um, that, that's available. Um, gene ontology is not the only ontology that's available. Um, there are quite a few others, um, and most of, it's just gene ontology is the most popular one. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a site called an ontology um, lookup, actually. Um, I don't know if this URL has been updated, but the, um, you can browse around uh, to about 100 different ontologies, and some of the ontologies might be useful for you. For instance, there might be a human phenotype ontology or a disease ontology or a, um, a, uh, a cell type ontology, which tells you, you know, um, which the gene ontology doesn't cover those things. Okay, so that's... Um, most of the information that you can collect about biological processes and molecular function cell location comes from the gene ontology. So it's important to kind of know where that information comes from. And then there's all this other information. So um, most, of this, most of this information um, uh, can be gathered from, from different databases. Um, I'll mostly, this is sort of actually two types of information here. One is uh, sequence-related information chromosomal posi position and individual information about genes. And then um, there's also interactions with other genes. And the interactions we'll be talking about mostly tomorrow um, in the network session. Um, but there's, uh, there's a number of, luckily, people have built um, nice resources that you can just go to and get all of this information in one place, a one-stop shop. Um, the three sort of main ones that most people would be interested in are um, Ensemble, 
which is a website from the uh, Sanger Center in the UK um, that has been involved in sequencing a lot of uh, genomes, including part of the human genome. Um, and Ensemble.org, you can um, you can uh, um, type in a gene and get a huge amount of information about that gene, a sequence. Um, this this used to be mostly eukaryotes, but actually it's recently been updated, so they have every bacteria spe uh, species, every bacterial and plant genome as well. Um, so there's now ensemble plants and ensemble uh, um, bacteria. Um, most people are familiar, likely, with, with how many people have used ensemble or use ensemble? Yeah. So this, in a lab, we can, we can try and play around with these tools, quick go and ensemble, and um, I'll take you through some of those. And those are really good websites to, to get familiar with. Um, because there's a huge amount of information there. Um, Entree Gene, how many people use Entree Gene? Uh, so quite a few. So Entree Gene is um, a website from the NCBI um, where that hosts PubMed, which probably everybody's used. Um, and it is uh, also contains a lot of information about genes, including protein-protein interactions, uh, but mostly it's linking to, to other, other sites. Um, but it's, it's fairly general. Almost every gene that has been sequenced and put into NCBI is, is in Entree gene. Um, and then uh, if you're working on a model organism, chances are there'll be a specific database. If you're working on a very established model organism, chances are there'll be a specific database to uh, organized by the community. Um, like if you're working on yeast, there's the Saccharomyces genome database or mouse. There's the, the mouse, um, a mouse genome database. Um, similarly for rat and, and Arabidopsis, if you're working in these areas, you probably have heard about these databases. Um, and those are typically the best databases to go to if you're, if you're working in that area. And, and WormBase, which Lincoln uh, runs. So if you if you don't find the information that you during the lab, we basically is giving people, the lab will be giving people a chance to kind of get familiar with some of these things. Um, and um, if you don't find, if, if, you're, if, you have a, if you're working on an air, in an area where that doesn't have good coverage in some of these databases, then um, the instructors will help you find uh, some resources um, that, that might be interesting, because there are quite a lot of others. Um, so one really useful tool that we're uh, going to go through in the lab as well that helps you get information about gene lists is called Biomart. Um, and it's actually developed by, by people who are now at the, the, in this building at the OICR upstairs, but it was originally developed in the UK. Um, and uh, Biomart is a um, general system for getting information about databases and biological databases. And kind of like the idea is you go into Walmart and Walmart has everything. Um, Biomart has everything about, about genes, about biology. And um, in particular, the Biomart uh, that is um, organized, that is accessible on top of the Ensemble database um, is, particular, is particularly useful um, because uh, it, there's a huge amount of information in the Ensemble. So um, how many people have used Biomart? A couple or a few. Okay. So, um, so this, is, this is like really, really fantastic um, because um, you just select a genome of interest. Hopefully the genome of interest is, is in Ensemble, but there's quite a few. Um, so here I selected uh, Homo sapiens from the latest version of Ensemble genes. And um, then you can select the... Um, uh, it starts off sort of, if you just select ensemble genes, which is all genes in ensemble, and then you select your organism, um, Homo sapiens, you're sort of progressively telling um, a biomark what you're interested in. And if you just select a, a, a gene, a genome or an organism, biomark thinks, okay, you're interested in human, there's 30,000 gene records related to human, um, or 20,000, and um, and help me filter this further. So there's a number of different ways you can filter. You can ask for all the genes in a region of, the, of, the, of, the, of a chromosome or um, a set of genes that you already know, like your gene list you can upload to Biomart and um, if you have specific identifiers that Biomart recognizes, you can, um, you can just say, okay, I have 100 genes in my gene list. Tell me more about those 100 genes, which is what we'll be doing in the lab. Um, and uh, you, can, you can ask for genes based on gene ontology terms. So if you're interested in apoptosis, you type in apoptosis, it'll give you back all the genes that are associated with the apoptosis term, gene ontology term. 
um, expression, multi-species comparisons, protein domains. So this says limit genes to um, transmembrane domains here or signal do things that have signal domains or maybe they have SH2 domains if you're interested in those. Um, and variations, give me genes that have specific types of um, population vari variation. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice um, ensemble using this tool. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll go over using this, this gene version to upload your gene list and get more information about it. So um, you select, those are all called filters. Um, you select the filters that you're interested in. And then once you've selected your filters, they, sh they show up here. I'll, I'll go through this in the lab with a live demo. Um, and, the, um, and then you can select what you actually want to download. Oh, sorry. Oh, what, what, is, what do they mean by expression? Um, I have to look in expression. It's probably um, things that are expressed in specific tissue or that are expressed in specific... Um, um, we, we can... Yeah. So, um, so you're a Biomart developer? Okay, so we have a Biomart uh, person who's actually developing Biomart. Um, so um, the I think we asked you a question last year when when we yeah, were she the yeah recipe, like, yeah. We <laughs> formatted the database. <laughs> so um, um, the uh, once you once you select a set of fill, once you tell Biomart what types of genes you're interested in, then you can select things to download. And um, there's a few different things to download. You can download information about genes, like all the gene ontology terms. You can get links to external systems, download expression. These are just uh, in terms of this little features category that I highlighted here. We can go through the website and see what other things are available. You can download all the protein sequences for your gene. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of information. Or all the structures, or all the SNPs, or all the homologs. Yep. How do the So Ensemble gets all of their information, their DNA. It's, our Ensemble is actually a big pipeline for automatically annotating genomes, and they get their information from the NCBI originally. So um, that's this CR, GRC. CH37 version of the of the human genome, um, and then um, Ensemble. Um, I'm not sure. Do they do they reassemble everything um, themselves, or do they use the assembly? I think they use the assembly for um, uh, that that NCBI gives them, and then just run a pipeline on that. So um, typically, um, and the, the, you, you might get you might get different versions of Ensemble with the same the same um, version of the uh, genome, and that's just because they've run the pipeline. They've updated their pipeline, which will update. Um, new information. They are, they're also curating information. They have different sections of Ensemble that curate hom uh, homology and gene models, and they keep that. They keep track of that. So as this this um, the the databases behind the scenes are growing, um, the next time Ensemble runs their pipeline and releases it, you'll get more information and more coverage. So one build of the human genome can have multiple Ensemble numbers. Yeah. With it. Yeah. So tip. Yeah. Yeah. So the GRC is actually. Versions, 
which will be different for that nation. But uh, but the the, the, the the international agreed upon reporting system that is the same for everybody. And that'll get updated period periodically. I don't know what the frequency of update of that that is. Um, it's not phased. Slow. Every couple of years. Every couple of years. But the, the important thing is that you get you get different genes from three different sources. Yeah. You see a C and C D I and ensemble, you'll get different sets of genes. They, there's a consortium to, to come up with a common set of genes. There's a set of called the C C D S project. There's about eighteen thousand three hundred genes that they all three agree on. Uh, and then they disagree on another Um, so, so that's for human, and if you're working in a model organism, typically Ensemble is actually getting their builds from the model organism databases, who are usually the keeper of the model organism genome. So they, they're, they're usually um, um, more, it's only because there's only one source, they're usually more standardized. Um, whereas for human, there's actually a number of different people interested in, the, in assembling and, and annotating the human genome. So I meant, we mentioned Ensemble. We should probably also mention a link to the UCSC genome browser. Um, UCSC, um, University of California, Santa Cruz, has a really popular genome browser that is um, um, used by a lot of people. And um, the only reason why we don't cover it here is because bio, this Biomart is is part is on top of Ensemble right now. I don't know if there's a Biomart on top of UCSC Genome Browser. I haven't seen one. Um, but uh, this is this is really easy to kind of get data from. But you might, as Lincoln said, find that um, the different um, genome browsers that might be out there might have slightly different annotation for, for an individual gene. Um, and that's sort of generally, I guess, there's a general comment to be made about genome annotation. Um, once the genome is sequenced, it's, the genome annotation, is, as you probably know, has, it changes over time. And it eventually sort of stabilizes, but there's always questions about does the gene start here or here, or is this an exon or, or not? Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the gene model where the introns, where, where, where the start site is, where the introns and exons start and end, is, um, changes over time. And sometimes um, new DNA sequence information is, is available in the, um, uh, is, is coming into the uh, system and the build system um, changes the way that they, the coordinates a little bit and so that updates all the genes for instance. So you might find that you go back and, and look at this system if you give it gene list today and then next year you give the same gene list there might be um, different coordinates for instance of those genes. Um, hopefully not changing chromosomes. But it could ha could happen. <laughs> so um, okay, so just um, throughout this lecture series, we s try and have summary slides at the end of, of the section. Um, the basic take home message is that there's a huge amount of, of attributes about genes that are useful in databases. Um, gene ontology provides gene function annotation, um, and there's um, a lot of um, uh, information about. Uh, Gene ontology provides gene, gene function terms, and there's a lot of annotation with the, relating to those terms, um, and there's a lot of information from Ensemble and Entree Gene, among other sources. Um, any questions about that before we move on? Any of that? Okay, so I'm going to move on to, um, what's our, our timing, Michelle? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Okay. Um, so, um, probably one of the biggest problems, headaches that people have um, when dealing with gene lists is, is gene identifiers. And so, um, this next section, I'm just going to tell you, uh, give you mostly some tips about how to do things so that you, you will reduce that, that headache. Um, so, identifiers are ideally unique stable names uh, or numbers of things that help track database records. So, your social insurance number is, a, is, a, is an identifier, um, but there also the entree gene ID 41,232 is an identifier for a specific gene. Um, and, you know, they're ideally unique and stable, um, um, but there's, there's problems with this uniqueness and stability in, in, in biological systems and biological databases. So gene and protein information is stored in many databases. And so the first thing to know, and you probably know this, is that genes have, can have many identifiers. So if you, if you type in um, 
Uh, if you go and look at a human gene, an entree gene, um, it has a whole bunch of aliases and, and other, other um, links to other databases where that gene is also stored. And so um, you might get from somebody, um, your collaborator A, a list of genes with identifier you know, entree gene identifiers, and the other person gives you a list of genes, and they have uniprot identifiers, and you want to somehow connect them. Are they this? The the, na the names look different, but they might they might be the same genes. Um, and there's also the other important thing to understand is there's different types of information in these databases. So even though we sort of sometimes think about gene, DNA, RNA, and protein all at the same time, there are actually different databases for those different types of things. So entree gene has only gene information, it doesn't store the sequence of the protein. Um, RefSeq protein stores the sequence of the protein and entree gene links to it. Um, and entree gene will have its identifier relating to genes and RefSeq protein will have its identifier relating to proteins. And you do need to understand the, the type of information pointed to by that, that identifier um, in order to properly um, connect it. So the NCBI, um, U.S. National Center for Biotechnology Information, part of the National Library of Medicine, um, has uh, Entree Gene, PubMed, and a lot of other databases. Um, this is just an example of all of the, this is something from their website that shows you all the way that all the databases link to each other. So it's actually very complicated. And each of these little circles of the database, they each have their own identifier. And, um, and if you have a gene, it could have an identifier in all of these databases. Um, just for your information, um, here's a bunch of common identifiers to give you a sense of what these things look like. So ensemble um, identifiers sometimes look like this long thing here. Entree genes are numbers. Um, unigene usually has the, sequ uh, the organism followed by a dot and a, and a, and a number. Um, and this is gene, RNA transcript, protein, and species-specific ones from different organisms. Um, also annotations, domains, and, and um, can have identifiers. It's not just genes and proteins. SNPs have identifiers. Experimental platforms have their own specific identifiers. So if you're using Affymetrix gene chips, you'll be familiar with these strange identifiers. Um, and so it, if you, if you this, this list is just in your binder, so to give you a reference to, um, if, if you, you learn these things, if you're working with a lot of identifiers, you should be able to look at an identifier list and kind of guess what, where the information is coming from. And we've, I've highlighted the ones in red that I personally think are the re recommended ones to use because they're the ones that are most often unique and stable. Um, okay, so there's so many identifiers, um, and converting them between these things is, is actually ends up being a headache. Um, how many people have had problems with this already? <laughs> so a few people um, nodding their heads and, and they understand this problem. Um, so um, one of the reasons why it's uh, a headache is um, that there might be different versions of the database. We talked about Ensemble having different versions and the human genome has different builds. Uh, if you get a gene list that was published in a paper um, from 10 years ago and it's in the supplementary material, maybe it's using identifiers from a, a database version from 10 years ago and th those numbers have changed. Ideally they'd be stable but maybe um, they found a gene there that actually doesn't exist anymore. People realized it wasn't a gene um, and so that identifier has disappeared um, or the gene has moved around and so they've changed the, the change sequence so they've changed the, the, the um, identifier to make sure that you don't confuse two genes that have two proteins that have different sequences. Um, and uh, um, in, so in because of these issues and, and also when you go from one database to another, um, one database might have links that are kind of out of date. And so um, uh, because of those issues, it's impossible almost to just get a nice clean conversion um, sometimes. So I'll explain a little bit more how to, uh, about how to, how to do that. But there's basically four main ideas in what you want to do with g uh, gene identifiers. Um, one is searching for your favorite gene name. So if you type in your gene name in a, in a website and you press find me all the information about that gene name, if the website doesn't recognize that gene, you're, that, that particular ID that you used, you're out of luck. So you should know that that gene might have other names and you could try those other names and maybe one of those names is recognized and you have all this great information about that gene. So obviously that's one use. Um, of understanding this. Um, the, the other thing is linking to related resources. This is sort of related. If you um, have a, a website, um, if, you're, if you're on Entree Gene, you should understand all the different types of identifiers and where they link to so that you can get the information that you need. Um, identifier translation, which is what we'll try in the, in the, in the lab. Um, um, basically moving from genes to proteins. A very common thing for people working with gene expression data is 
Um, you want to, you have your gene expression data in Affymetrix IDs and you want to get information about them, so you want to translate those to genes, like entree gene IDs, so that you can put them into other systems. And you also um, want to merge, uh, if you're merging data sets from different collaborators, you need to combine, move them into a, a common identifier system so that you can you can do this. So luckily there's, um, there's a number of identifier mapping systems, mapping services that help you do this. So um, the one that we've chosen to use for this workshop is called Synergizer because it's extremely simple, um, but it uses information from Biomart and a couple of other proteins, a couple of other sources. Um, there's also a new one called Picker, Protein and ID Cross-Reference System from the EBI, which is only for proteins. If you're working with proteins, this one looks like it's pretty good. Um, and basically, um, you know, in Synergizer, you choose your species, you choose your authority, in this case, ensemble, um, and you say, okay, I have Affymetrix IDs, I want to convert them to entree gene IDs. And you can, you can do that. And we'll go through this in the lab. So um, it's particularly important to um, just understand a couple of ID mapping challenges that uh, happen to everybody, um, just so that you can avoid errors. Just these are these are a couple of things that you that might crop up in your day to day work that you, um, if you just know that they're possible, then you can make sure that you can try and avoid them. So um, one thing that that people often do is they use um, a, a common name for uh, a gene name like the protein name, um, which might not be standardized, um, and so it's not unique and stable. Um, and so these, these IDs are all relating to P53. Everyone who knows about cancer research you know, they, uses the term P53. But the actual standard Hugo gene name is TP53. And so th this is the, the symbol that you should use in your gene list, not, not these guys. If you use these guys, you, it, there might be another protein that is called one of these, these things. Um, or another gene somewhere. And so you'll, you'll, you'll get cross-links. So, um, um, and if you get these cross-links, if you, if you have an ID that you think is one gene and it's really another gene, that could be a pretty big mistake. Um, in fact, there was a Nature paper five years ago that was retracted for this reason because the per people looked at HES1 and there was another gene called HES1 that had a different capitalization and they thought they had this big new story, but it was actually the wrong HES1 and their paper was retracted. So, um, you know, if you get to that stage where you're really going to town on a gene, you better know that's the, the right one, right? Not just have this identifier mapping problem. So um, another thing that people might have seen is that Excel, when you use it, most, most, a lot of biologists use Excel spread, uh, spreadsheet software to use their, to work with their genes. If you copy and paste a really big gene list um, into Excel, Excel by default tries to recognize, tries to be smart and recognizes dates. Um, so if you have a gene called OCT4, which is a pretty important transcription factor, it will change it to October 4th, or worse, it could change it to some number or some, some weird date format. And um, so you might have seen this, and it's like incredibly difficult to get Excel to not do that. So um, um, you, can, you can kind of do it by ensuring the format of the columns is text um, before um, you know, typing in. Sometimes by default, all of the, the columns in, in all the cells in Excel are general, and so it tries to guess what if it's a number or text. But if you really force it to, to be text, then it, won't, it, it usually won't do that, although you really have to check, because sometimes it just goes back to um, general and, and you don't realize it. So, and this, this is, as I said, a problem when you're, it's not a problem when you're typing in a few genes, you can fix it, but if it's, if you're pasting in a thousand genes and like one at the bottom gets changed and you don't realize that, then you're stuck with that, then you might, you might find out, only find out later. Um, and the other thing is that there's usually problems if you, if you, if you have a thousand Affymetrix gene identifiers coming from your gene chip, and you want to get information about all of them, all thousand identifiers, um, you, you, um, there's often a problem reaching 100% coverage. And this is due to the version issues that I mentioned before. Um, and so sometimes you can type, you can put your 1,000 Affymetrix gene, gene IDs or probe set IDs into, into Synergizer, and you press, and you say, give me all the gene ID, the, the entree gene IDs. Um, and Synergizer will often return less gene IDs than the number of Affymetrix IDs because of the relationship that um, there's actually more than one Affymetrix probe set ID sometimes for, for a gene. Um, so you, that will map to two Affymetrix IDs will map to one gene. But um, 
Synergizer will tell you if it can't, if it doesn't recognize the Affymetrix ID, and if it doesn't recognize the or whatever ID that you that you put in, if it doesn't recognize it, you can go to another source and try and find out if that ID is recognized in another source. Maybe the the ID is out is out of date, um, um, it's or or it's not yet or it's too new, um, it's not yet an ensemble. Um, and so um, typically, what I do is I use one of these systems like Synergizer and it gets me 90 or 95 percent of the way there and then I manually um, take the, re the remaining things that, it, that weren't mapped and I go to the other other websites and try and get in, try and increase my coverage. You might not care that much about increasing coverage but um, the, these, these recommendations are kind of mentioned here. So um, okay so recommendations for doing this and we can do this in the lab. If you're, if you're working with gene lists um, I recommend mapping almost everything to Entree gene IDs using a spreadsheet, um, and then um, um, and if you want 100% coverage, manually create the missing mappings. Um, be careful of these Excel auto conversions. Um, I forgot to mention that there's actually a paper here. I think we we gave it as pre-reading that um, actually talks about problems with mis all the different problems with mistaken identifiers and name errors um, using Excel. Um, and uh, the only issue, the only caveat with using gene IDs for everything is that they won't work with splice variants. It doesn't consider splice forms. So if splice forms are important to you, then you need to use an ID system that, that, is rec that differentiates splice forms. And many people these days are, are um, and many tools, especially the tools that we are going to be talking about, kind of just recognize genes. So even if you have splice variants, there, there probably is not specific gene ontology annotation about the splice variants or things like that. So splice variants are very important, but they haven't been um, annotated to as high a level, um, a high level of detail as, as genes have. So typically we kind of move to genes and then, and then use that in the future for the downstream analysis. Um, okay, so um, genes and their products have, have many um, identifiers. Um, usually you need to deal with, if you're working with genomics information, you need to learn how to convert these from one type to another, um, but there are services available to do this. And, and if you use these tips, then you can um, reduce the, the headaches of, of, of having problems. Yeah? I just want to add that actually that's one of the big differences between the browser and the production stuff. So if you are using the stuff, you have to use NCBI to lock up Uh, any questions? So that's it for sort of the intro morning session. Hopefully that was interesting to uh, people who haven't, haven't seen some of that stuff before. Um, we now have a, a break. And um, what time do we come back? And at 10 to 11. So we have a 20-minute break. And then after the break, we're going to open up our laptops and try out some of these, these sites. What I'll do for the lab is I'll, um, I'll show you guys I'll kind of go through the um, some of the websites that I showed and and um, with specific examples just to show you how it works and you can all watch me do that and then the rest of the lab is basically trying out some of these things. There's a specific lab assignment that is very simple, but basically the idea is just get you to try out these websites and um, and ask and and uh, provide time to answer all your questions to make sure everybody's um, you know on the on the on the same page and and get some time to be get familiar with these and learn these tools. Okay? So also the, the idea of the breaks as well as Fran Francis and Michelle mentioned before is that, you know, meet other people in the class, um, other researchers who might be interested in similar things. This is a sort of the networking idea of this. Uh, networking is an interesting side effect of these courses that, that's pretty cool.